an initiative of the Greater Des Moines Partnership formed in 2007, the Business Innovation Zone, the Biz, exists to connect entrepreneurial needs with qualified resources and to provide guided professional and business direction. The Biz helps entrepreneurs maximize their successes by helping them navigate resources, strengthen knowledge, improve skills, form strategic alliances, and secure proper capitalization. To find out more about The Biz, visit www.bizci.org. Probably the only company in the world that does this. Um, I know because the 
biggest banks in the world are coming to Sioux Falls Highway. So, um, so uh, where we're at, um, so this is Iowa somewhere in there. Uh, these are customers that send us money. Um, this little circle is about as far as I could drive uh, on the Civic. We go to golf outings and back to drive on the scale. Now we gotta go funds. So uh, next slide. So a little bit about us. We're startup company of the year five years ago, software company of the year last year. Uh, top five mobile bank eats in the world. Uh, top ten companies to watch in banking. Uh, go around the home field. That's a good story. <laughs> that can actually reflect what we're gonna talk about today. So next slide. Kind of all over the place. But uh, Tech Club in Iowa, so I, I used to be a Adobe Enterprise Evangelist, which basically means I'd go into rooms like this full of geeks that didn't want me to be there, but they were perfectly okay with me buying geeks and beer for them, and try and convert them into something. So I spent tons of time in San Francisco and all over the world. Um, the funny thing about Iowa is the head of uh, infrastructure for Twitter uh, graduated from Iowa State seven years ago. All right. Um, one of the lead developers of HBase, which is uh, from Facebook, and stumbled upon the band, uh, is an open source distributed big data database. Uh, he's from that for Iowa. And so there's, there's all this like crazy talent in Iowa. Wait, I'm not from here. You have to look at the art and all that. Um, but uh, a lot of these people left because there wasn't a good cultural fit. So now we're getting applications from people that left 15 years ago because they applied at Rockwell. And Rockwell, thank you, you know, but, but culturally it wasn't a software company, it's a more of an engineering type of company. And so they, they've been at Yahoo or whatever, and now you know, they're 42 and they're thinking about starting to think I'm going to see, maybe I'll come back. Uh, so there's no shortage of amazing talent that comes out of this state, there's maybe just a shortage of. Uh, Iowa Nice, where we don't tell about what we're doing uh, to keep those people here. So, next slide. So, the first thing I'm, I'm going to start with, and, and I've tried to put these in order of importance. Um, so, <coughs> what's going to be fun is the sixth slide has invest in an ecosystem. And so, if you run out of here and you say, well, we need to sponsor Tech Peru, like, you totally missed the point. Okay? <laughs> so, these are all in order. And the next slide doesn't matter if you give up on a slide. So if anyone after this first one considers themselves out of it, you know, feel free to leave. You know? Okay. So articulate the purpose is the number one reason somebody comes to work for a tech company. Okay. So first slide. So if you come in for an interview with a technologist, they really want to understand a very clear six month, one year, and three year vision. You have to be able to articulate this. This is like a VC ditch, right? Like that level of detail uh, in order to get them there. And if, if the story is, you know, we're going to sell a bunch of consulting projects and keep, keep doing that and you get to work on all these different things, second problem, second side, they want hard problems, okay? So it's really hard. Uh, this vision also has to be a hard problem that you're out there to solve, right? So, uh, you know, I would say we're picking on hard problems, uh, and, and that attracts a certain amount of certain technologists because they want to refine their skill sets, right, over that vision and focus on that hard problem over and over. So, uh, if you're semi-technical, raise your hand. All right, nobody wants to build CRUD apps, right? It's called CRUD for a reason. So that, um, you know, they don't want to update forms and fields and do a little work for other things. That's not a hard problem. Hard problems are, um, I, I think John Deere is a great example of a company that's reinvented themselves as a software company over the last five years. So they've, they've kind of said, hey, we're going to autonomously control um, all the vehicles in the field and allow the dash to travel around with the mobile user. Like this, this is a very hard problem. There's no Wi-Fi, there's no all kinds of things. Uh, you 
can't print Google Maps. Uh, so by doing that, they've articulated a better vision, and now they're starting to really be one of the companies in Des Moines that can attract and retain some of the best people. And next slide. Uh, revenue growth business model. So what I mean by this, does everyone kind of know what that means? We should all say, yeah, but like, we're totally revenue growth. Um, IT is not revenue growth, software is revenue growth. So if the job that they're hired for is to cut costs, right, in, in the end, like, they're not dummies, right, they're problem solvers. So I cut all these costs, then what's my job after that? So it's usually not a hard problem because the problem has been solved, we're just trying to do a cost reduction strategy. And a lot of times, um, on the revenue side, see people want to get better. They want to get specialized, which means we need to grow revenue so we can hire more people, so I can continue to specialize my trade. Does that make sense? <coughs> if you're just there and you're going to do the same thing over and over again, you're a technologist, you get bored really easily. Like every one of us has ADD right now. Okay? <laughs> like we just want to fish it, we want to play with things. Okay? So if it's not a revenue growth business, it's going to get boring. My skills, it's not a hard problem. My skills are going to become useless, right? And technology changes every nine months. So um, not a good place for me to go. Next slide. Our vision must be the guiding rule. So this kind of comes up in here. This is a really polite way of saying uh, we're, we're so focused on the vision that even if your boss is in the way, you don't get in trouble if you do something because you're trying to follow the vision. Which means there has to be a purpose there, right? So it means that uh, this could also be a good leadership talk as well. There's many overlaps. But vision has to allow a software developer to uh, that be the guiding force. If you think about it, what does a software developer like to do? We're talking about agile and iterations and things like that. They, they need that longer term goal so they have some freedom inside of there to make mistakes, go make mistakes, and, and keep on going. Next slide. You absolutely must answer the why here. Because right? uh, why on earth should I bring my problem side of ability? to your company. And I think if you don't answer this question, if you don't hammer through these things right away in that interview session, if you don't reinforce them on a you know, quarterly basis, people lose track of the vision, they lose track of the why, and they lose track of wanting to work on my problems. All right, I think there's one more. Okay, so vision really comes down to uh, you know, making sure your senior management team your divisional management team is all on the same page, right? So that you don't have one person going to mom, one person going to dad. You know that trip, right? Both ways that it is. So it's really about keeping that team focused on that, so that it gives the people uh, that you're supporting the freedom to work on those harder problems, and to really, really focus on that. So that, you know, Des Moines has uh, uh, you know great company, Walla. That last slide. If you think about that slide, you know, we're solving our problems, we want our vision. Um, I assume that they don't have a hard time finding programmers like Sam. Uh, next. Any questions on that, real quick? No. So this is why I can have that slide, and like, we're good because that's an executive level um, how, how you need to. So software culture, uh, <coughs> go ahead, first one here. Basically means programmers are first class citizens. All right? Um, no programmer wants to go to a company that uh, some companies, I don't want to stereotype this, it's like you get the programmer a donut and you get code back. Right? <laughs> Does that kind of make sense? Like we show up with you know, some, some blazers each day and everything's great. Um, if you really think about the vision side of things, they're there to solve hard problems. And I think one of the worst things we ever did as a country was decide 
to outsource software to the area. I mean, think about this, like, this computer stuff's catching on, right? <laughs> so let's make all the best people that solve our computer problems in a different country. Like they should outsource the CFO that sent them below there. I, I, I get the call center, but um, you know, if you've never seen the porn field, it's really hard to write software about it. Right? And we have people coming all the time, and I don't do like everyone knows probably won't get some great commodities prices this fall, right? You know, it's too bad for too much rain, but if you get a crop and that type of cultural reference, you know, gives them part of it. If, uh, if it's just a cost sign. All right, so that kind of leads back to that there has to be a revenue growth side of things. But if you think of IT and programming as the same thing, uh, good luck hiring programs. Uh, so Bano outsources IT. We don't fix our laptops, we don't fix our printers. I don't know the wireless password. You know, a company comes in and fixes that type of stuff. And we have got like 60 computer scientists Pretty sure we could figure out how the wireless system works. But it, culturally, for me, I think that's not your job. I know you're capable, but that's a, that's a great fix problem. Somebody has to deal with that. Uh, on, the, on the server side of things, we you know, use a lot of Amazon and, and uh, uh, other tools that make it so that people aren't replacing RAM. Next. Uh, you really have to articulate the engineer's bill. So that's back to a little bit about purpose, but in a software culture, think about um, you know any of the great software companies. What what is their asset? What are they create? And that resonates to the entire company. I don't think anyone at Apple is confused about the fact that they make intellectual property when they write each line of code, right? Uh, uh, resources are strategic. What I mean by this is. Um, you have an eighty-five thousand dollar program. Has a five-year-old laptop. There's a lot of mismatch here. Right? If they can't, they don't have the right development environments. If they don't have the right um, you know, books and all those type of things to allow them to be the best that they can be. Uh, real quickly, people know that this is a cost center, right? Because we're already rack, you know, uh, um, rationing uh, CPU capabilities to them. Um, there's nothing that's going to piss off a programmer more than waiting for four minutes to compile your intellectual property. Okay. Next. Uh, remove Aaron and assholes. Um, so programmers, uh, in by definition, are introverts, right? So I'm a I'm a freak of nature, super outgoing person in the world that I come. This, I don't exist. Uh, the the arrogant assholes, especially if you're on what I would say the business side of things. Um, uh, the other ways of calling calling these people are cowboys or you know, rock stars or whatever. Uh, they're so infectious. And since you have a pile of introverts there, uh, that's what nobody talks about. Right? But they're all frustrated, they're all really mad about working with this person. But this is the person that has a code ownership, right? Like they, somebody commits something in their code base and they're like, ah, it's normal, you know, what are you doing there? Uh, that person has to go. It doesn't matter how good they are, it doesn't matter how much uh, technical debt they've hidden from you, and you aren't really sure how to get around that. They, they have to go. And, uh, and, in the state Bible, like we all know each other, right? There's 140,000 geeks in that. <laughs> You're literally like one away from everyone just by having Dan and I here today. <laughs> so um, we already know who those people are. So when you hire one of them, we're like, wow, okay. Um, now you'll see a mass exodus coming out of that company race. These people are usually really great at interviewing. So I put that up there because. You have to be conscious about the referenceability of that person. The big thing that you'll find is they're always siloed in individuals. They want to be the absolute best, they're authoritative, they're an arrogant asshole. Next. Um, 
leadership has to build complex, has to have built complex systems. And what I mean by that is uh, if you if you bring in a programmer and there is a technical track and a business track later. Okay? Um, there's no technical track and business track at Amazon. There's no limit to the amount of money you can make at Amazon if you're technical. A great technical person with experience is worth 20 times more than somebody with, without that experience. The other thing it allows you to do is there's certain types of problems that only people that have been at this for a long time can solve. And if you don't have those type of people on your team, your bandwidth of peak types of things that you want to solve, your scope gets flattened. It doesn't matter how many $50,000 people a year you throw out the problem, they can't solve it. Because they haven't been there before. And so when you're bringing people in, then you want to work with people um, that have done this. Next slide. Overall, culturally passionate about languages and systems. That's a nice way of saying, you know, don't stamp that it's got to be .NET or else it shouldn't work here. And these are just tools. Um, next slide. Helps if the CEO is a real geek. And so I was going through this with some guys, and, and they said this, and I was like, oh, thanks, that's nifty. And they're like, no, think about it, you know, go for Amazon, um, Microsoft, Netflix, go Facebook, whatever. Go through the list. Uh, when it really comes to the software culture, right, your leadership has to understand things like technical debt. Otherwise, uh, you're never going to have the resources to solve that. So this is. This is nice if it exists. That's a hard one to change. I mean, you have to just go fire your CEO after this talk. But um, what's more important is that your leadership gets it. And by getting it, I don't mean that they have an MBA and uh, they went to an agile boot camp for a weekend and now they know how to scope the problem. But then they've gone through this before. All right, next. So that's our CTO right here. He is constantly sitting down with people in the program. That's why I made him my CTO. Because he exhibits the same type of things that I used to do. And that's a, this is a pretty common area. Uh, real quick, no shortage of resources for collaborative repair program at Man. Next. So the technology stack. This one is hard. Um, but uh, we'll, we'll go with the first one. Language is segmented by the person. Okay, I mean, if you're a geek, you get what I'm talking about. All right, so if somebody rolls up to you and says, well, I've got eight years of ASP programming, pretty decent at Microsoft SQL Server. And uh, the first thing I say is, what do you do in your spare time? Play golf. I say, have a good day. You know, keep on doing what we're doing. And if they go, well, why do you guys use Scala? Because everything you can do in Scala, you can do in Python. It seems semantically similar and has type of alpha. You know, like, okay. <laughs> I don't care that you know about our stack, but let me know something about us. And so your technology stack is something that in a hiring process should be articulated. And I really, I really believe that. So if you've got a bunch of resume or job openings on, on dice, stuff like that. People segment whether or not they even apply based on what you're showing there. All right, so in modern technology stack, these are just tools, right? No religion here, right? It's just a tool. Um, so if, if you're using a tool that was the best tool five years ago, uh, it speaks volumes to the type of culture that's going to be there, right? And it, if, if people come in and they say, well, let's use Git for version control, right? Because that's the best. Well, you know, we, we bought Enterprise Star Team 25 years ago. So we're going to use that. That same person that really likes Agile, likes to iterate fast and do all those type of things is out the door, right? Whatever we, we have an SVN server, it's not always on. Okay? I, I know I'm starting to find the Enterprise keys in the room. All right. <laughs> Innovation requires innovative technology. 
So we aren't using Scala in HBase because it's fun. There's no documentation. You gotta read the source code to figure <laughs> out how it works. All right, but we're one of the only companies in the world that are doing real-time you know, functional programming on event stream processing of transactions. So that's the problem. There's an innovative technology that helps do that. And, uh, and so now when you get back to, well, it's not technology for technology's sake, but it is technology that allows people to, to use the best tool to solve the problem. Next. Uh, continuous deployment, this is not something that um, the, that senior level person you just can't find to figure out how to fill that wreck doesn't want to babysit it between your programmers. Right? So if you don't have automated test frameworks and continuous deployment, uh, there's a large section of individuals that are not going to uh, respond to your offer because they know they'll have to go fix it. They know they want to work on hard problems and they don't want to come in for six months and just get your practices in place and clean up the kitchen sink. Next. Uh, infrastructure as a service. So you at least have to have VMware. Uh, what this means is if I want to put a test environment together or something like that, you need to be able to stand that up for the program, right? So um, on the West Coast and in New York, if, you're, if your company's not in Amazon, uh, it's really hard to hire a software developer, right? Because they want to just spin up 25 servers, test it all out, break it down. It's just a, just a tool. Uh, VMware does that too for, for those guys that have uh, embrace open source. So sometimes this is this is really funny. Um, Facebook is one of the largest open source contributors. Google is the largest open source contributor. Um, then that Chrome thing's kind of nice. Angular JS is pretty nice. Uh, Go the programming language is pretty nice. Like why do, why are they giving this stuff away for free? I mean they pay those people to work with us. It turns out collective intelligence is really important. Um, and every single library that you're standing on top of is really nice if other people have found the edges of that. And so uh, there's certain environments, Microsoft, for example, is becoming, uh, like five years ago, I would have just said, just don't use Microsoft, right? But culturally, their company is changing quite a bit too. Um, but embracing open source is a company-wide culture thing, right? So if every single JavaScript library that your developers want to use needs to go through a two-month uh, enterprise approval process to get that okay, um, it's really hard to keep programmers, right? Or they have to go write the same thing that's already in open source that the rest of the world uses. I'm sure they're not copying it, right? <laughs> control C, control F, control R. <laughs> Double backbone, JS. <laughs> um, so these are great things because we can't reinvent the world if we want to go fast. All right. So these are all tells, right? In an interview, they're trying. You're interviewing them. They're interviewing you if they're any good. Uh, also, again, this is as of there. If they leave, this is usually why they they're leaving. Uh, next, no religion. Who's, who's a J2 EE certified developer? I am. Okay. That's religion, man. That's. I got a big silver bullet. And no matter what we solve, we're going to use Hibernate and J2 EE. Okay. Um, so, from technologies, it's just a tool. It's a tool to solve a business problem. And in technology, because we get a little passionate about it, because we're kind of weird individuals and we like StarCraft and this. Um, you know, there, there's, there, there's so much uh, individual identity tied up into work when you're a programmer that, that we almost create these cults, right? So, you know, let's start a Ruby versus PHP conversation. Um, you know, with Cassandra versus HBase. Uh, these type of things are, are, there's no point, right? They're just tools to help you solve problems. Um, 
you know, it, it, it's always amazing to me when somebody like LinkedIn says, you know, they're, they're dropping Scala for improving in this division. It's like hacker days, I suppose. Um, it has no point. Next. Uh, for fun, go to uh, bannon.com for such internships. Yeah. And look exactly how we've laid out that page. So we are selling the technology stack we use. Literally, parents pay their kids to fly to Cedar Falls, Iowa, from Boston to uh, work with our programmers because of this picture. All right, that's how you get people involved. Next, continue learning. This seems like it should be like a pretty simple one. How are we doing on time? Okay. Um, it seems like it should be a simple one, but most programmers, like I said, are their identity is wrapped up in programming, right? They love this stuff. Um, it, to some of them, it's the first good thing they've ever, first thing they've ever actually been really good at. That people respect them about, right? Like, nobody cared about their Star Wars facts growing up, but it turns out now if you can program like you're kind of a man because the man that these are nice. Okay? You just gotta get them to CrossFit and Anne Farrell's and they'll be great. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> and we do have a rule at bars don't talk about man with the girls. <laughs> That's an extra continued learning experience. <laughs> You're married with three kids? Uh, first slide here. Uh, you have to be disciplined to do code readings and do notes. I think, even if they're internal, right? Have to, have to, have to, have to. Do them every week. I know there's deadlines. I know there's spikes in development. I know there's all these things. But it takes habit. It's like working out. Right? You stop working out for one week and then the next week. You don't really go on this third week. Like, you want french fries look good again. And as far as we malts look even better with french fries, by the fifth week you're at Monster Burger twice a day. Okay? Same thing happens with these things because you can't, it's an intangible asset. It's really hard to figure out the return on that investment. But really what it's doing is it's breaking down silos of communication. It's dissipating knowledge throughout your company. It's making sure there is a code of ownership throughout there. So it's critical. Uh, because for younger people, they, they can't normally challenge a senior developer, but in this type of environment, it's not a challenge. Hey, why did you write that code that way? I'd like to understand why you did that. Now, the senior developer, these guys stay up all night, right? It's because uh, they're just, oh man, this is how I did this. Well, they you know, they're 20 minutes at 2 a.m. and they refactored everything to get ready for the presentation. Okay, next. Books and Book Club. Everyone who's a geek likes to solve all the hard problems, right? First off, you want to fix these overarching issues that nobody else has solved before. Uh, technology, every nine months, whatever you did nine months ago is irrelevant. Anyone bought my Adobe Flash book? No. <laughs> I was the best in the world at that, but I it doesn't really matter right now. I'm as a PHP language contributor, if anyone's using that. Sorry, I don't have that crap as my fault. So those types of things um, are really about this atmosphere that it's exciting to learn. Geeks will do this on their own time. You just need to give them the supplies and give them the time to discuss it. Again, senior leadership has to be passionate about the same. We call it a conference per diem, and it's part of their compensation. All right, so you come in, if you're a junior developer, you get $1,500. Literally get your job offer. Okay, I, I don't care where you go. But they all end up going to the same places, right? If you're a software engineer, you get some more. If you're a senior software engineer, you get some more. If you're even higher up, you get even four conferences a year. This does two things. Number one says, we're committed to you becoming better while you're here. But the thing it does is, um, turns out we're wicked smart in zero calls. Okay? Like, that doesn't pay well. You need 
need to send people to Mecca, Silicon Valley, to Boston, MIT, to New York, and go to these places where people realize, wow, there's other people like me, and they're a lot smarter. The, the gains you get from that is they come back, yes, they teach things, but they also come back and they go, man, I want to get better at what I do. Maybe I want to get better at my trade, my passion. Right? The thing here is introverts don't come and ask to go to a conference. They whine about it. Man, this is the WDC again. Right? <laughs> That's because you registered three minutes and so <laughs> So, yeah. That's most Google I have. I wear my Google shirt every day, an Android shirt or whatever. Okay, so these things are really important, right? And the software companies that build those type of products, they can get that, right? And that's why they have Mark Hamill as an MC and everything, right? Mm -hmm. Who knows who Mark Hamill is? Okay, we do have, thank you. A couple weeks here. All right, everyone else, is, you can go to the Salesforce conference. <laughs> <laughs> Room five's going to be that, I'm sure. So, um, <laughs> but, but they're not going to come and ask. They're not going to come and ask you for a book. Does that make sense? They're not going to ask you to go to a conference. If you say, would you like to go to a conference, what are they going to say? Yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> Damn, I don't know. <laughs> right. So you have to explicitly set this stuff in place because I'm never going to ask for it. Okay? Uh, next. A clear mentorship. And what I mean by this is, again, um, outside of the arrogant asshole that knows everything, um, programmers don't really like to ask for help. Has anyone ever noticed that? Okay, so you have to make these intersections to allow them to become better. You give them books, but did they apply those things? Right. So, so your your senior level people just make sure that they like coaching. Right? They love mentoring. They want to dissipate that knowledge into there. And most senior people do like that because they don't want to answer the page right away. Right? Because they did that for ten years already. Okay. So clear mentorship again, like conference for teams. Is you know if you have Microsoft Exchange server, like there should be a calendar. Thing, or they know when that time is going to happen so that they can go through their code together. So if there's no feedback to them, that's still fine. It gives them the freedom that they're on the right path towards the vision. Does that make sense? Because most programmers have an amazing anxiety that they're going to be fired at any time. They're introverts. So, you get, so you know, their annual three, 360 review has nothing to do with programming, it's just their life. That's not enough feedback. I mean, this is a, a, a bi-weekly, if not weekly type of thing. So we alternate mentorship days, uh, one week, and then the, the next time is a code review or a meetup type of thing. Then anytime you launch a product or, you know, a new, new piece of software, uh, Anybody can attend it. We do full technical team dive. And it's what was good about it. You know, here's the assumptions. I like guess context is key in software. Here's the assumptions we have about going into it. Here's what we learned and wish we would have known. Would have been nice to have operators, right? Um, and, and this is where the budget exploded or, or whatever. And then here's the technologies that we used to pull that off. Full and rip through it all. So again, um, you're trying to get rid of that code isolation, and you're trying to give people an opportunity to discuss um, uh, openly, safely, again, they're introverts, a safe place to discuss what they've done, get corrected criticism if necessary, but uh, it's, it's not a, a closed door meeting where your code is broken. All right, next. You must give people time to do technical spikes on new concepts. And what I mean by that is um, uh, uh, there's certain programming paradigms that are the value of the programmer that have nothing to do with the technology they use to implement. So if you've built you know, ASP, JSP pages and you've used 
in an MVC structure, it's really not that difficult to do that in a different language, right? Uh, but what happens is, you know, uh, technology moves. You need to give people that time. Maybe it's a month where where they they've been knocking it out. You know, we had a bunch of people that were really proficient at Adobe Flex. And it was the best thing in the world um, for building you know, really rich web applications. Um, you know, with web sockets. Some weeks, web sockets aren't there yet. It was in Flash in 1994. So, uh, 2009. Um, so, but those same people are really get great at MVC patterns and things like that. So you have to let people know that there's this time. We took all our Flex developers and now they're iOS or Android developers. The same people, they have the same experience in the domain. Uh, they know how to solve problems, they know how to communicate in the group. Uh, but they needed a couple months to, to make that transition happen. Does that make sense? Because otherwise you're like, I'm going to run you hard like a horse and then put you out of the pasture and shoot you, right? If you don't have a clear way where you can kind of make these, these technology transitions. And, you know, you should do that in your own time. It's nice, but uh, it's not really a long-term event. Next. Uh, so I guess I just slid over that but Technical spikes on new concepts. Um, uh, I should, so we did like a. Uh, the last thing I just said was for this bullet point. <laughs> this bullet point. Uh, we did we done technical spikes on, you know, we got like our own ACH driver, credit card swipe reader, and um, QR code integration to blow up point of sale systems, and um, you know, there's all kinds of stuff that like you go and play with. Right? It's not production code. You know, it's one big meeting class or whatever. But it works. And really, you're not focusing on the code on these technical spikes. You're focusing on the problem. And it allows you to uh, you know, go try and fix something for a month, come back and say, well, what have we done about this now? And address that differently. Um, this overcomes your ability to not try and pigeonhole people into uh, um, scoping projects like this. Well, if I threw it a little bit farther out there, I'm sure we can get it done. So everyone knows about the myth or man month. We call it, there's a six month like We could rewrite Google in six months, but all of our programs we say, well, if it's six months, so I can get that done. Of course. <laughs> so we like, rewrite Google in six months, you know, and um, especially if it's just me and then. Um, so <laughs> these technical spikes, when you look at something and, and you get you know, deer in the headlight looks, you're like, hey, what would it do to take to do this? That's a great time to go, like, let's prototype something. So people call that like intro hackathons or different phrases like that. But it's really about learning about the domain, the problem you're trying to solve, and not about like, the technology and all that other stuff. And again, you need technical people in leadership so they don't go show it to. So, you know, to the SEC, uh, with the you know, combat drives itself. And that was a technical spider, right? So um, that's where you need those kind of technical people to, to ensure that um, they know that it's just technical debt, it's perfectly code, and it's fine. They want to learn about the problem. All right, one more. Um, make sure you're making environments that people can get together in. And, Starbucks really isn't that nice. Uh, you can make Starbucks look in places inside your organization that people get together and work on stuff. Uh, it, it's really worth it to have these type of learning type experiences. Okay. A transparent atmosphere. Um, again, think of the group we're speaking to. We're talking about hardcore geeks. Uh, they already know everything. Otherwise, they're going to become a programmer. Uh, so, what we do is we display metrics that tie back to the vision. And so, um, transactions processed in a day that got enriched. We do a bunch of fancy stuff to a credit card transaction. Uh, that's really important to us. User adoption rates, return rates, all these type of things that ultimately lead to the bottom line, so they're nice for that. But they're also nice where people get to see how that, what they're doing on a daily basis
pieces, right? They've updated the UI, they made the sign up process easier, converts to real metrics that are being grabbed out there. So, thanks. Create safe zones for open dialogue. So, uh, again, it's really important to be explicit. So, we have something called Beer Spectre every Friday. And it's, uh, uh, it's just time where you can talk about anything. And it's, just, it's a safe zone. Thanks. Uh, Map the employees' value to the mission. For, for technical people, this is really important because they, you know, I just write code, I'm really into you know, type theory. How does that apply to banking? Right? Um, well, you kind of have to walk it back up a little bit. Next. Openly iterate on the process. This is just a simple way of saying we don't know it all. Right? So, from the management side of things, we love iteration of software. Make sure you're open to iterating. <coughs> Process around that, and for us, that's it's been really great. We we totally got out of business if we weren't getting those constant feedback loops for how we manage things. Next, commit to quickly fixing issues. What I mean by that is, um, you know, a lot of the programs are program. So if there's problems that are stopping them from doing that, maybe it's a development environment, maybe they don't have a simulator, maybe they don't have whatever. Um, don't say good thanks for that feedback. It's like we'll have this done, but we're not going to do it for a year because that's you know, we're not going to. We're going to do that right away. Really clear communication. Next, this is the why. Why are we building? Why are we building a kernel? This is a new product for us. Why is that important to the kernel? Right? And you really have to continue to reinforce the why. So why is the problem? So I'll one more. This is your perspective every Friday. Um, it's basically, the concept's pretty simple. It's, it's our joke on retrospectives from Agile. Uh, but we don't want everybody going to the bar and bitching about what we right? We want to be coming in after here. Um, not everyone has to be here. Um, but just to kind of share that. We've got one more. This is important to Right? So, encourage speaking to geeks, get them to Iowa Code Camp, do those type of things. So, um, I actually used to have encourage speaking in S as a dollar sign. So, we've got people applying for the largest tech conferences in the world and we pay for them to go. And it's just because the value you get out of them going is great. Uh, and technology user groups attend. Don't, don't send the 25 year old there. Right? You gotta go. The leadership has to go to these type of things. And you have to speak at them too, right? Um, you wanna hire job developers? Well, when was the last time you spoke at the Central Iowa Job East? Okay. Next. Uh, regional conferences. Make sure people are going strangely. There's great things in Chicago. Um, and, some, and getting involved in those type of areas that builds community. Uh, I met a guy who worked at Amazon. In, at Strange Loop in St. Louis four years ago. Um, he now is in charge of infrastructure for us. And it's, it's through those type of conversations and, and things like that that you are hiring these people for your men. Next. Invest in your open source community. So if you're standing on this code, get back to it. I don't care if you send the person who fixed your bug coffee. Um, you know, if you work at it, you know, and if I would bet John Deere, like every open source person that helps us out would have like John Deere t shirts, right? Um, I mean, I just I use that brain that we need all over the place. Um, but, but get involved and help those people that are helping you, whether that's committing code, fixing bugs, or donating coffee or t shirts. Next, uh, support your foundation is basically things like this. So, um, Mike's helped me out quite a bit. More than pleased to try and hopefully I'm helping out me here today. And so it, it reciprocates, right? So if you're not supporting those that are around you and kind of giving back to that, uh, I'm on the board of directors of Technology Association of Iowa. Um, and we bought more beer at Tech than any one company in Iowa. Um, and uh, I'm on the board of the Association of Financial Technology, which is crazy because they let me on. But, uh, you know, that's the community that, that I'm kind of a part of. But it's also all the 
old source things from the RLG. Next slide. So this is a bunch of stuff. The high level stuff is the important state of things. You can remember those, those six different bullet points. And I tried to give you examples of what that actually means, right? Um, but to give you a kind of perspective, we have 32 computer science students. Um, 28 of them are from, 27 of them are from you and I. So basically, that's a pretty good feature program for us. Um, we have people from Carnegie Mellon. We have people with degrees that we don't hire until they go to the intern program. Um, but, but, you know, that's part of investing into the people we're trying to get here. Um, it kind of tells them they're doing something, something right. So, next slide. All right. That's it, unless there's questions. Oh, there's got to be questions. Not a problem. So, so most of the time we wear suits, which is funny because there's some anger people in there. <laughs> um, and so I'm really excited to be like the like, main entrepreneur today. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I know exactly what payroll is. Um, <laughs> Well, um, this is 
So there are some other things other than rest, but they have to expose rest. All right, so we have zero. A bunch of things that are faster than rest. Um, but you, you have to do it that way. And, and that was something we decided a long time ago. And uh, you know, what's been fun is we've had a huge of these huge banks or huge uh, service providers come in and they're like, well, you know, we already have our own management UI. You know, we just want to take this from you. How can we do that? Like, here's the problem that I'm have on. So that's something that I can't take credit. Uh, you know, uh, there's a lot of Amazon's. Other questions? Yep. So it sounds like you probably don't really end up getting bad hires if you have people when I said this this way. You should be the right people. But like if you do have a situation where you've got somebody that's not fitting in, or clearly they're just not even fit, but you guys resolve that real quickly, or how do you guys yes. handle Well, two ways. I mean, we've had the intern account used to be larger. It's almost we're through then. So <laughs> some of them have gone away already. Um, and uh, or some of them said, you know what, I guess I don't really, really like programming. Um, so there's some of that. Uh, we we look for problem solvers when we hire people. I, I know everyone says that, but I think we really focus on people that uh, like to solve problems and like to help people solve problems. Um, I had an interview on, on Monday this week, and the guy um, was like, I want to build a, a code school for you know, helping people internally that are like internal specific projects. He was kind of just talking out loud about how the things he wanted to do to help people. And, and so and he's really on Rails, Rails guy. into teaching him the languages we use uh, to get his 15 years of cultural experience and he's not very good at um, So uh, what's probably not scalable is I, I normally get involved with most interviews. Uh, I mean, there's lots of interviews that they never get to me, but when it comes to somebody to be hired, ultimately, I sit them down and I say, here's the vision, here's what we're up to, and things like that. Um, which is really important to have. Luke Amdor, is, I would argue, is one of the best programmers in Iowa. Uh, we, had, we hired him three years ago. And he is just like, you know, he, he types code at 120 words a uh, and I mean, he's flops. Uh, but he also loves coaching people and doing things like that. And, but I knew when we were on the right path was uh, we released Kernel at Finnovate um, a couple weeks ago. And He's like, this is exactly what we talked about on my board three years ago. And, and, and that he was getting that to the rest of the team. And so that, that was exciting that we actually meant what we wanted to do. Like three years ago, I told him, like, this is going to take three years. And we're going to do this mold banking thing, but don't worry about that. <laughs> means to that. Probably one more question. Go ahead. Uh, technology workforce wise, right now, 14% of women. So I was wondering if you guys, what you've seen, you know, if you can share some perspective on that and steps maybe you guys have taken. You know, in that regard. So, um, you know, our technical writing, account management, channel management is like 100% women on the technical side of um, product implementation and things like that. I think their brains are just better at multitasking. Um, but I think that's a STEM problem. Probably not, you know, maybe I'll run for governor someday and we'll fix it that way. But um, it really is, I, I think that's when we get discouraged uh, or stereotyped or not has nothing to do with. And that leads to quite a, a greater problem. Another problem we have is um, I went through, you know, the UNI computer science program with 140 friends. Uh, they, they got like one of four people going through there right now. All of them were interns of mine, so good luck. I, I took that call. <laughs> <laughs> that the whole class. Yeah, like I got the whole I have sophomores from you and I in my internship program. Like, you know, sorry. 
like, they're all mine. Uh, so, so somehow, I think, uh, if you think about what I meant by IT, IT versus programmers versus first class citizens, uh, we have down to the grade school level, grade school level issue with people saying, well, well, that's computers, that's going to, you know, that's being outsourced. Right, well, help this goes outsourced. Uh, break fix goes outsourced. Innovation and, and the creation of IP is very much America. Right, so uh, I think we have to overcome that in parents. It's easy to think about, so I'm 34. You think about me up 10 years, right? That's the populace that has, you know, my, my oldest is six years old. That's who has kids there, and they went through dot com. Right, and that's what remember you could make hundred grand if you like to do music with a job program. Like, wonder why that didn't work out. Okay. <laughs> so my oldest brother, eight years older than me, he was one of those guys. He, he was a uh, worked in CSI in Minneapolis. Um, so that dot com parent that thinks all those jobs went overseas is our biggest problem right now. And, and that's both women and men. Thank you very much.